Hallelujah. Good morning. Oh, you have no idea how good this feels. All right. I said I'd give you a minute, not three. Amen, amen. All right, control yourselves. I said control yourself. Remember, we're still in the presence of Almighty God. He loves your joy. But don't forget the time that, it ta that we also need to be silenced before, before him. Amen? Well, I've got some things I'd like to share with you this morning. And I, first of all, I want to thank those men that stood up behind this pulpit. Let me, let me tell you, this is not an easy ground to take possession of. But at the same time, I'm so thankful for the Spirit of God that is in dwelling both of the men. They are anointed of God to share the good news, to share the word in truth. Not just in what feels good, sounds good, but to speak it just like it says in the word of God. And if we speak it and live it like it is in the word of God, we will know and understand the real truth. And we will not be deceived. You remember last week I shared with some of that uh, in Colossians 2. And, uh, but before I get into all of this, um, God has really taken me back. And that's why I said it was so um, gracious of him to um, reward us with that song, Grace Became Amazing. Grace is not just grace. Grace is amazing. When we really stop and think what grace is, it's not just something that we got that we didn't deserve, but it's understanding that grace is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he had to come and take on flesh and then be ridiculed, beaten, to suffer, and then to die so that you and I could live free, free of all oppression. Uh-oh, are we free of all condemnation? Are we? So I want to share some stuff to, to, uh, with you this morning. And, but before I get to it, I, I want to, I, I've received a, a email from this gentleman um, the other day. And I want to share it because it, it really goes along with what I'm going to share. Make hell tremble. Huh? Do you know that's what we're called to do? Not just to get by, but someday in the sweet by and by, we're all going to be out here and everything's going to be perfect. It says that we're called here to make hell tremble. In John, 1 John 3, 8, this, listen to what it says. For this purpose, what purpose? To make hell tremble. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. He took on flesh. He walked this earth just like you and I are. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen? Amen. Come on. Okay. So, did he do it? Well, I hear some yeses and some amens, but maybe the rest of you are unsure. I'm going to ensure you today and assure you the work is done. It's finished. It's complete. Jesus is not coming back to fix something that is broken because he already has. Grace was completed in Jesus Christ. Our sin was wiped out, covered in his precious blood. It also goes on to say in Isaiah 53 that our sicknesses, diseases were placed upon his back. Come on. And yet we turn around and say, yeah, but. Listen to this. Is the devil giving you fits today? Shh. <laughs> Is he causing trouble for you at, this, at every turn? I know. If so, turn the table on him. You have the right and the power and the authority to turn that sucker around. Put it back on him. Start making him miserable for it. 
You have the power to do it, you know. You have the power residing in you to destroy his works, to heal, to deliver, to set the captives free. Where did you hear those words? Did they, weren't they not spoken by our Savior Jesus Christ? And if we are in him and he is in us, guess what? We can do the same thing. That's the power of grace living in us. You have so much power in you that every time your alarm clock, Debbie, listen to this. Every time your alarm clock goes off, the devil should wail, oh, no. That troublemaker is awake again. I've seen these words written on a mirror about seven years ago on my first visitation to Deb and Keith's house. In Deb's bathroom on her mirror is this almost exact thing. And it says that we are to be troublemakers. And on hers it says that, the, that Satan would say, oh crap. She's awake again. <laughs> so you can put it in every la any language you want, but it, the, the whole purpose of this is understand what we have available to us and how we're to react at the situations that come up, upon us. Not in fear, not in, 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 in uncertainty, but with the assurance of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? So the title of my message today is doubt and go without. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to do a little bit of uh, Bible turning, not a whole lot because uh, I'm watching my time. I haven't been up here in a while. And uh, I can get overly zealous. I can get so excited that um, I might even start dancing. Uh, it, ha it, it's, it, it It's happened and I got to control myself because one thing I never want to do is get in front of God. Amen. Look at verse 4, shall we? First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whoever... whoever are any whoever's in here? Huh? Yeah, we're all whoever's. That means anybody. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Amen. Now, this is the word of God. This is not Gerald speaking. You know, from my experience, my testimonies, this I'm telling you is the word of God exactly the way it reads because you're looking at it. It says, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And there again, we're going to talk about focusing on understanding this precious, precious gift that was given to us. It's called faith. I think sometimes we need to go back to the basics. And I, I don't see how faith can be called basics, but for some of us, it may be the basic of understanding this God kind of faith. I'm not talking about the human kind of faith. I'm speaking on the God kind of faith. See, when God, when he created the earth, he spoke it into existence. He didn't take a little of this, a little of that, and throw it all together and hope. Sometimes I think we do that because of our nature as human beings. We take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Well, I remember my pastor and my Sunday school teacher saying this, and this Sunday school teacher taking that, and this one saying that, and now I hear this, this come together here at the Sanctuary Cowboy Church, and now I hear this over here. So now I got to choose, or do I take them all and blend them together and get the best of the best? I hope that's not your theory. Because my Bible tells me is when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Free of what? Doubt, free of uncertainty, free of lies and confusion. See, that's what the, what the devil's all about. Do you believe with this? Do you believe this with all your heart? With this, what we just read. Whoever is born of God or whatever, whichever translation you have, overcomes the world. You're already a world overcomer. 
If you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're already an overcome, world overcomer. Look at verse 5. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Did you see that? Who is he? Who is the he? Notice the he is, is not capitalized. It's small. So who is he talking about? He's talking about the whoever. Whoever or whatever is born of God is who he's talking about. So this whatever who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the beginning. And as I said earlier, it's God who calls us. He knows each and every one of us by name, and he calls us by name. And there's many a times that people are sitting in the church, sitting here, and I feel in my spirit, and I've had others share it with me too. Somebody here needed to make a decision and chose not to. That's because the Spirit of God was calling your name. And sometimes if we wait too long, he goes silent. Because he knows your heart. So don't think, well, I've got until the day I take my last breath and then I'll choose Jesus and all will be okay. Well, if you believe in that theory, good luck. See, I want it now. I want all of it because I want to walk this kind of life out as a world overcomer. Walk by the true understanding of the faith of God that was measured to me to operate in this world so that I can bless people, that I can touch people with the healing power of Christ. Amen. That they can see it. You know, as we live in this world, everything we operate in is on that soul man. And you've heard me talk about that soul man all the time. Our mind, will, and emotions. And then there's our six senses. Uh, we regulate how we operate in this life by our soul when we're supposed to be operating by the spirit man who knows all things, yes, the deep things of God. Faith is, now listen, faith is the over, world overcomer. Did Jesus not say, be of good cheer? In this world, you'll have trials and tribulations. That's the part we always remember. But listen to the second part. But be of good cheer. See, when you get into stuff like this, when stuff like this happens, it doesn't say, oh, my God. He goes, be of good cheer. Why? Because he overcame the world. And if you are in Christ, you're in a world overcomer. Huh? Come on. Remember, we live in this world, but we are not of this world. We sang a song. I... Um, which one was it? Um, Keith wrote. He, he writes some great songs. Um, I'm transformed. He's, he's quoting Romans 12. I've been transformed. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's not what that verse says. But that's what you've been tra transformed into. A world overcomer. And in receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God gives you his faith to operate on. He said, here's the gift, and I'll show it to you a little bit later on. Turn with me to Mark. Now, many of you know this story, but as I said, we're going back, and we're going to study the Word of God to understand these deeper things of God and what Jesus was doing. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 23. And I'm going to read through 34. So follow along with me, okay? Everybody there, say amen. amen. Now we're talking about in verse 22, you'll see that the person that Jesus is uh, referring to here is J um, Jairus. Now Jairus came to Jesus because his daughter's sick. And look at verse 23. And he begged Christ, he begged him earnestly. Did you see that? saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many uh, 
uh, physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. We're going to talk about that. When she held on, heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I can touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the, um, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction or the suffering, the suffering left. Sometimes we look at that word affliction and we just, okay, it was something that hurt. No, it was suffering. I like that translation better. She was suffering and the suffering left. Um, verse 20, and immediately, now this is amazing to me, and immediately uh, Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples, disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you? And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told her, or told him the whole truth. In verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Amen. Praise God for the reading of his word. So what is this what is this story really talking about? And what is what is what is sometimes hidden from us that we need to research, we need to spend time in God's presence to hear from his spirit. That's why God put his Holy Spirit in us. He is the one who teaches us the word. He's the one that gives us understanding, true understanding of the word. And we have listened to other men teach his story. And I, I don't know about y'all, but they don't always get it right. I believe they've left out some of the most important parts. And that's what I want to share with you today. First of all, Jair, Jairus, J. Iris, he begged God, Christ to come with him. Amen? And it said, my daughter is sick. So Jesus went through him. But look at this in verse 24. And a great multitude. Have you ever noticed throughout Scripture, everywhere Jesus went, there was always a great multitude following him? Do we understand why? I think in most cases we do because he fed them. He healed them. Uh, when the disciples were out in the boat, he calmed the sea. I mean, they heard and seen all these things that Jesus did. And they were always gathered around him wherever he was going. Take one minute and just ponder on this. Where is Jesus today in your life? Are you focused on what he's doing next or where he's going? How is he operating in my life? Am I focused on that? In this situation, how, how and when, where do I imply? What, how, do I, how do I focus in on what Jesus would do? You remember back in the 60s, they used to have the 60s, or 70s, 80s, whatever it was. We used to wear little uh, bracelets on here, WWJD. What would Jesus do? You know, I, you know, at first I kind of laughed at that, but you know what? I found out the more I wore it, the more I looked down to remind myself, what would Jesus do in this situation? And, and I think sometimes we, we forget who's dwelling inside of us and what's dwelling inside of us and that we have the power to overcome whatever it is. I don't care what it is. I'm going to share that more with you. Okay, and so notice this word um, in verse uh, 24. A great multitude followed around him, followed him and thronged him. This word thronged is something I want to look at. And I had to go and look. I wanted to know everything about this. It's to surround, to crowd closely. together 
So I mean, we're talking, hugging in, and we were, they were within inches of Jesus. They were so, there were so many, they just kept pressing in. This is what the disciples meant when they said, what do you mean who touched you? Do you realize there's hundreds of people and they keep pressing? I mean, even the disciples pressed, knew the pressure of the group that was following them, that was hanging around them. And yet Jesus said, who touched me? Why? Because he felt the power of the Holy Spirit in him drain out, the anointing. The anointing was drained out. Not completely, but it did leave him. Why? To accomplish what she said would happen. Now, did you hear what I said? That she said would happen. <clears throat> Look at verse uh, 27. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Verse 28, I hope you have it highlighted, underlined, it, high marked, whatever you need to do. For it says, if only I may touch his, car, his clothes, I shall be healed. She had full confidence. She had full faith in understanding if I can just get close enough to him. Now, remember, there's more to this than just her getting in next to Jesus. It's her faith in who he was and who what he could do. You remember, she's already been to all the doctors. Oh, hello. That's why God gave us doctors. You've heard me say this time and time again. Praise God for the doctors. I told them when I was in the hospital how blessed they were of God. You were chosen of God to work on my wife. That doctor came to me and said, you're lucky you came here. I said, luck had nothing to do with it. Because I don't believe in luck. I have faith in a living God. And God chose you. He chose you. Be the one that does the surgery on my wife. Not because you're so good, because he's so good. And you will listen to everything. And he's, she is favored of God. Therefore, you are favored of God because you get the opportunity to work on my wife. And I shared with you what he said to me that, well, we're going to try this and try that and hope that this all works. But I just want to let you know that there's a good chance. Well, what happened to the hope? Because now there's a good chance she's going to wear one of those bags. And immediately I spoke up. That ain't happening. Because tomorrow when you go back in and you continue this surgery. By the way, she did three surgeries. This was no easy task. But I told him tomorrow after I'm done praying over this, you're going to see things you've never seen before. And your hands are going to move like they've never moved before because you're going to watch the glory of God extend those damaged intestines that you cut off and you're telling me you hope. You're going to watch those intestines grow. And they're all going to come together and then you're going to stitch them one stitch. And I said, then you come and tell me how good my God is. See, how, how how did I know? I didn't know, but I know what the Word says. So I put the Word to work. I let the Word live out through me. Why? Because my heart, my spirit, man, knows that's the Word of God. And if God said it, I believe it. Period. Now, have I got into situations where I missed the mark? Yep, I'm human. But that's why we need messages like this to reconfirm and reassure. You know that, that word assure, assurance, to know for sure is what it means. To know for sure that God is faithful and what he promised he is able to do. And he's already done it through his son, Jesus Christ. If you look at Abraham, stop and think of Father Abraham. That when here God gives him all these promises that he's going to be the father of many nations and I'm going to give you a son. Now, now listen, even though Sarah can't have kids, it's impossible for her to have kids. 
She told her husband, I cannot give you children. But what did God say? I can and I will. But God took too much time. So they both jumped the gun and he, and he got the um, Agar. Agar pregnant. Did God abolish him for that? No. So here comes Isaac. Now, I'm going to jump ahead quickly because I'm running out of time. Jump ahead. Look at in, in, uh, when he was 12 years old. Here comes God again. I can just imagine God looking and going, are you enjoying your son that I promised you? Oh, yeah. Well, tomorrow morning, I want you to pack him up, go to a mountain that I will reveal to you, and sacrifice him to me. What would we do? I know what it's like to lose a, a daughter. Some of you also know that. But here God is saying, I gave you, I blessed you with this son. And here I let you raise him for 12 years, and now I want you to take him to a mountain and put him on a sacrifice, on altar of sacrifice for me. I love the faith and the understanding of Abraham. That so many times we, we miss the value and the, the truth of the word of God. It says that all these promises are ours in Christ Jesus. Whatever God promised, he is faithful to fulfill. So what did he, what was he, what did he promise Abraham? That he would be the father of many nations. And through his son Isaac would come even more and more and more and more and more and more, including us. Amen? And yet here now all of a sudden God wants to take this child away from me. But with obedience and faith in God. Remember in Hebrews it says that it was accounted to him. Amen? What was? His faith. His faith in God. See, God promised. Did, God promised you and I that we, we are healed in Jesus' name. Our sins are forgiven. See, if we're not healed, then our sins aren't all forgiven either. You can't take part of it and believe it and the other part not believe. I'm sorry. This is what the Word says. By His stripes, you are healed. Not maybe someday. And if you get a good doctor, and God blesses the doctor, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, I'm just telling you, we need to get out of that old way of thinking. It says, seek ye first. And all these other things will be opened up to you. What? We have to seek God. We have to get before God and lay our petitions before him. I didn't say beg, even though this lady here, she had to beg, or Jairus had to beg. We don't have to beg. See, then the work hadn't been done, hadn't been completed. On this side of the cross, all that work has been done. You do not have to go before God and beg him to heal you. How can you beg for something you already possess? How can you beg him for money when you already prov uh, you, he's already provided us with the, all the provisions? See, we've got to get out of that soul man thinking well on this part i can believe in faith but on this part there's something i need to do well get out of god's way and let god show you what he's already done that's all i can say so this in throng and so now a certain woman had an issue of blood we already know that she spent everything she's broke she has nowhere else to go and it's shameful when you stop and think on this side of the cross, we have to get into that same position before we finally lay it over at the feet of Jesus. God, I've got nowhere else to go. I know you're able. I don't remember seeing that in the Bible. See, God is the God of done I provide. I've already provided. Everything that you need has already been provided. So why are we going and asking God, well, if you got time, 
I know you can do it, but I'm not sure if you will. Now you see where I get my title and my message? Amen. Doubt and go without. I'm sorry. It's just like Abraham that I just shared with you. He did not doubt. He told his, his helpers, his servants that he took with him. He said he took all the wood. We all know the story. He took the wood and put it on Isaac. Huh? Jesus laid on a wooden cross. He put the wood on Isaac, and they carried the knife and carried the fire. And then Abraham told his, his uh, servants, the boy and I are going yonder, and then we will return. Now, wait a minute. Didn't God tell you to go up there and offer up your son Isaac? See, if he would have said, maybe we'll be back. That all depends on God. If God shows up, we'll be back. If he doesn't show up, I'll come back on my own. See, that's not the way our God operates. God made a promise. We need to know and understand the promises that are ours in Christ Jesus. And all the promises of Abraham are yours. Amen? It's, it's, it's all about the promises. What is mine? You've heard it said before because my brother was the one that brought it out. If I put a million dollars in your checking account, but you never draw on it, what good is it? How is it going to benefit you? If we, have more, if we have more faith in the system. Okay, listen to this. Here's an example. How many know what that is? It's a light. But what happens before that light comes on? What has to be there? How many of you can see electricity? I know you see the light bulb. But can you see the, the electricity that's running through these lines? And then those lines that are outside that go somewhere down the road and end up at a plant that produces electricity. That electricity is always flowing. Even when the lights are out. That's the Holy Spirit. He's always working. He's always moving. If you go clear back to Genesis 1, it says that God looked on the earth and then the Holy Spirit was hovering over the darkness of the earth. He's always working. He's there whether you see him or not. See, we don't need to have all of a sudden these casts fall off of my feet and I start running around in order to believe that God has is, is performed healing. It's right here. Why? Because God said so. That's why when, I, when we were in the hospital, all those doctors and nurses and all their aides, they kept clinging to our room. You know why? Because the presence of God was in our room. The Holy Spirit was all joy. There was joy in our room. I had one of the aides come in. She was a cute little thing. And she, she'd come in. she even had to change my pants. One thing I have never done before in my life. <laughs> it's a humbling moment. And uh, she would come in. She said, I get so excited when I walk into this room. You always have a smile on your face. You always greet me with a joyful greeting. Was that Gerald? No. That was the Spirit of God living in me and living out through me. It's God. It's the Spirit of God that she was witnessing. I was being a testimony of the goodness of my God. All I had to do is just live in Christ and let him live in me. And they would see the hope. And then to have a nurse come in and have the opportunity to pray with that night nurse. My wife will be telling her stories. I mean, there's so much to be thankful for. Faith did not work. Listen, uh, in verse 28 says, For she said, Touch, and I shall be healed. Faith did the work. Do we remember reading in there where all of a sudden Jesus goes, In the name of God the Father. No, he turns around and said, Who touched me? Her faith drew out of him the anointing of the presence of God, the healing power. You and I 
already have that healing power in us. All we have to do is flick a switch. You want the lights on? Flick a switch. Try calling Idaho Edison and saying, hey, my lights aren't working. And they go, did you turn the switch on? No. Isn't that your job? And they go, no. We supply, but you have to flip the switch. It's already there. This is no different. It's already there. It's already done. All we have to do is flip the switch. Where's the switch? Right here in our mindset, in our understanding of the Word of God. Everyone in the crowd were following Jesus because they had a need. They didn't, they didn't follow him because he was a good-looking cat. He had cool, you know, raised sunglasses on and, you know, and, and just had all these cool clothes. And, you know, he was just different. Well, the only thing that was different about him is the spirit that was in him. And that's what they were seeking after because they seen him do things that no other man could do. And they were enthronged, getting closer and closer and closer. I mean, I can just imagine Jesus walking like this because all these people, including his disciples. See, that's the way we should be. We should be so enthronged in the word of God that we can't get enough. I want more of it. I want to know what I've been promised. I want to act on the promises, to live these promises out so others can see. See, many today believe that we are operating in faith, but the need or desire for God to meet that need is not faith. It says we live by faith, not by desire. We live by faith, wishing, hoping, and even how we pray. Now listen, even how we pray may not be of faith. Check yourself. As I said, it's easy to go, God, I know you can. So if you got time, I'm here ready to receive. What do I mean by praying not of faith, not knowing God's will? You want to know God's last will and testament? You want to know what God's will for your life is? How does God heal people today? It's all through his word. If you go to John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the so Jesus is the Word. He's the living Word. So everything He did, everything He accomplished in His three and a half years here on life are available to you and I to operate in that same power, that same authority, because He gave it to us. He said to His apostles, now you go and do likewise. Amen. Don't cut it off right there. Amen. Remember, when He said that, He breathed in them His Holy Spirit. Then he turned around and gave him another instruction, another command. Go to Jerusalem and tarry there till you've been endued with power. So they went and they hung out, 120 of them. Soon and very soon, he's going to show up. No, they weren't sitting around twiddling their thumbs and, and wondering or worrying or being frustrated because he didn't show up when we walked in. They huddled together. They came as in one accord, in oneness together, praying to Almighty God and continue to pray. And then he showed up. And with him came the power of Almighty God. It's the Holy Spirit. We know that, right? And did not, does not the Bible said that the Spirit of God, the living Spirit of God, the power of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living and dwelling in you. Flip the switch. 
I should have put that on my heading. Huh? Praying, God, we believe you can fill our need. This kind of faith does not line up with the Word of God. It doesn't fit. It's not there. Even the devils believe there's a God. I want you to go here, James chapter 2. Are you getting anything out of this? All right. Hebrews and then James. Look at James chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Now, I just said that even the devils believe in God. Do you think Satan believes in God? Of course he does. God created him. Not to be evil, but he created him to be a leader of music. Oh, I heard this spoken this morning on TV. You ever wonder why people are so drawn to music? And what kind of music are they drawn to? Huh? Let's see, we got metal, we got rap, we got all kinds of horrific, ugly, ugly music. Who do you think is the instrument of that? Don't have to go far. Amen? Look at verse 19. You believe that there is one God. Say amen, because I know you do. You do well. Even the demons believe. They don't only believe, they know because they tremble. Look at verse 21. Was not Abraham, I'm sorry, I got to turn the page. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Oh, now wait a minute, Gerald. No, works is out. Works is out. No, 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 no. We're no longer under the law. The law is a law of works. You have to do to get. Flip on the switch. Know the word of God and what it says. See, this is how we're deceived by those who lie and tell the untruth to make us feel good about ourselves. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you remember what I just shared? I, or Abraham said, hey, hang on, guys, we're coming back. Well, how, what do you mean you're coming back? Didn't God tell you to go and make a sacrifice to kill your only son? Yep. He did. But he also made me a promise. I'm holding on to the promise. And not only that, my God is so powerful, he raises the dead. Just saying. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac at the altar? Why did he follow what God directed him to do? Because he knew the promise. I will make you. The Father, and from your loins will come all these people. You won't be able to count the stars. They will be more than all the stars of the sand of the sea. That's a lot of promises. He understood the promises of God. Did you hear that? We have to find the promise that lines up. Because God is faithful to his word. You can sit there and pray and pray and pray and pray and ask and ask and beg and beg and beg all you want. But go find the promise and watch what happens. Flip the switch. God knows his promises. All my promises are yes and? Amen. Oh, where did you hear that? Well, I didn't hear it. I read it. Because it's a promise. Look at verse 22. It says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? Huh? See, now we're, we're talking, sometimes people teach this as two different. Well, we can't do, we don't have to do works because we live by grace, which is faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. No, let's go back to John when Jesus said, now you go and do likewise. Did he not give us a commandment to go and do the works of Christ? In fact, we've read in Mark 16, where he even said, whoever says to this mountain and believes in his heart, these signs 
What signs? Healing, vision, raising the dead, healing the sick, saving the unsavable, however you want to put it. But those are all laid out for you and I to do. They're given to us as commandments of Christ. Yet we say, oh, no, that's not for today. That was for the apostles. Man, I wish God would have made me an apostle. Oh, 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 oh. I read the word in the word somewhere that I are one. Okay, verse 22. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect? So we can't just sit on our derriere, on our blessed assurance, and say, oh, God, if you got time. I know you can, but. Ooh, glory. Hebrews eleven six. You don't have to go there. You all know it. But without faith. I'm not talking about human faith. Do you know that we have human faith? <clears throat> huh? It's built in us. We have human faith. But when God places his faith in us, that human faith is secondhand. Because God's kind of faith is the God kind of faith. It's empowering faith, and it works all the time. <clears throat> it says there, but faith, God, the God kind of faith, it is impossible to please him without it. Did you hear that part? I even spoke that this morning when we were singing. It's impossible to please God. How many in here want to please God? then allow that switch to be turned on and let the power come in and work through us and out of and through us, just like it did at that, not, that morning or not, that evening of, of Pentecost. Immediately, they went out and started speaking and preaching the Word of God. They started doing the gifts of the Spirit. They started healing people. I mean, all the things that Christ did, all of a sudden, this 120. Oh, by the way, it wasn't just 12. There was women and children there, 120 of them. So, gals, don't think you're left out. Children, don't think you're left out. Not if you believe in God. The power of God is dwelling in us. And therefore, he says, now you go. Take dominion. Act like me. That they will see Christ in you and I. The hope that we have in Christ. We have eternal life. There is life after this. I don't care what they say. Because they don't know the word. In fact, they don't even really truly understand science. Amen. You think God is able? If we just think he is not faith. If God is, not was or will be, there is no someday when it comes with God. You remember everything with God is today. Amen. Many believe God's power to move, but lacks the willingness to do so. Oh, I don't know about you, but that hurts. That hurts. Ever heard this? There is faith being spoken here, or God doesn't heal everyone. I mean, you've heard me say that a lot. You know, and it's sad to say, but there's people that believe that. There's Christian people, believers in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And believe that God does not heal everybody. I got to show you something. Colossians 2.8, we were there last week. Let's go back again. You know what? You don't have to go there. I'll go there. I'll make it fast. Got to get past Philippians here. 2.8. Beware. Lest anyone cheat you. How are we being cheated? Because we're listening to what they say because he's a pastor. He's a preacher. He's a teacher. He's a great man of God. He even wears a nice suit or a cowboy hat. Now, it's not limited. 
Don't limit it to just some other faith that walks around in three-piece suits. Because there's a lot of people walking in blue jeans that believe that God doesn't heal everybody. Why? Because they don't see it. Can you see your salvation? When did you see the day that Jesus went like this when you accepted him as Lord and Savior and he went, checked, all paid? None of us. Not a one. But we believe it through what? Through faith in Jesus Christ. If Jesus said, I've paid for all your debt, it's paid in full. You don't owe nothing. And yet we believe that. But when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, we say, oh, that was only for the apostle. That's why God doesn't heal everybody today. You know why God doesn't? Oh, nope, sorry, let me change this. You know why we don't see healing every day? Just like the multitude that were there around Jesus and thronged around him, they all had a need, but they didn't know if he was able to do it or not. But there was one. How did she get healed and nobody else? She reached out. See, it wasn't just believing in her heart or in her mind. She reached out. She said, if I can touch his garment, I will be healed. We call it faith, but there was action in that faith. We ha she had to know this is the man. This is the son of God. I've seen, I've heard, now I know, and I want. Because all the doctors couldn't do anything. She spent all the money, everything she had, all her life savings. But all she did was put her faith in Jesus Christ and bam. See, faith is in a very important word. Remember, we are not of this world. We are overcomers of this world. So how do we overcome? By the power of Jesus Christ, the resurrection power that is living in each one of us. Colossians 2, beware lest anyone, um, yeah, 2.8, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. What does that mean? They're taking their ideas and their, their train of thought and their, oh Lord, do I really need to say that? It works. Philosophy works. And that should put the fear of God in each and every one of us. Because the other day I heard on Victory Channel News, actually it was on uh, Thursday night on their special program, and they played a video of about 25 or 30 gay men of San Francisco. They're called a choir. And you know what the title of their song is? We're coming for your children. And you won't even know it. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the traditions of men, what, what is going on? What's acceptable today? Is that acceptable according to the word of God? No, and I mean no with, sorry, Eric, explanation points. No means no. It's an abomination before God. Now, it's the sin that's the abomination. God still loves that man or woman. But he hates the sin that has just totally encapsulated them. They're so into the sin part, they have no understanding of the, the uh, love of God. And they think they're doing good. You and I know it's evil. It's evil. We need to be praying. In a week or two, we're all going to gather together down there. Not all at one time. But as we go in, there's opportunity to go in and pray over this. Pray. I mean, we've had abortion. Over 61 million babies killed in this country. Oh, one nation under God, uh, indivisible, and we're killing babies. And that's okay. You know why? The woman has a choice. 
That's why we gathered together and supporting that organization over there in um, Boise, right across from Planned Parenthood. They said, no, we don't accept that. They have a choice, and we're going to show them the other part of the choice. Life is good. That's life that's living in them. It's not just something. We have more. We have more love and respect and kindness for dogs, cats, and dolphins. Animal of oh, sharks. I have one. Yeah, I heard one guy uh, that he wrote a book on loving sharks. We went into their world. They didn't come into ours. That's that's the twisted world. But this is why Jesus said in John 17, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, do not take them out of this world. There's so much for us to do. Yes, I'm all excited. Jesus is coming back. We're going to meet him in the air. It's coming, coming very soon. But when you look at all that is still left undone, we should be rising up. They call it woke. I call it awareness. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to become aware of the evil that we've allowed to overtake our nation. And say enough is enough. You can do whatever you want to, to me. I don't care. Throw me in jail. I'll give them a salvation message. They ain't never. Amen. I don't mean to talk about that. Okay. Over. But anyway, we must move the position of hope into a position that God has provided. Not our hope, but the, the work of God, the finished work of God. Ephesians 2.8. You have been saved by grace. And I'm going to finish right here. There's so much more I got to tell you. You've been saved by grace. What is grace? The finished work of Jesus. It's done. Through faith. That faith in operating in the finished work of, of Jesus Christ, knowing what he did and understanding it's mine. It's if I can't see it, I don't believe it. As simple as it is. It's a spiritual understanding of this God kind of faith. See, it only comes through accepting Jesus Christ because now our old man is dead to the things of, of God, but the new man is raised up into a new life and a new understanding of the goodness and faithfulness of God. That God is a God of faith. He operates by faith. He speaks faith. Amen. And he put that in us. Do you know Adam, when he was created by God, received the spirit of God, the likeness, the image of God, everything. When, when God put him in control and said, you have dominion all over all the animals, everything that crawls upon the sea, it's all yours. Take dominion. And he told him, now go and name it. Do this and do that. How did he do that? Did he pencil it? Oh, he, he got his laptop out. <laughs> and he said, oh, I got it. He says, that's a funny looking dog. And so he went to the Internet. Oh, 
No, it's a cow. No, he had the understanding of God. The discernment, I preached this, a message on that. He had the, the same discernment as God. Whatever he seen with his eyes, it was the same thing that God seen. Do you and I see what God sees? Because God sees you healed. God sees you prosperous. God sees us having dominion. Taking control, what he's given us control over. And yet we turn around and go, oh, but God's in control, not us. It's God. God's already done the work, people. Now he's working through his people. Is God just going to sit by and let us fall? No, absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. Galatians 5.22. Listen to this. Listen to this closely. We've all read it. We all know it. And I'm going to end with this one. I almost promise. The fruit of the Spirit, now listen closely. Hear the words. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So, the fruit... Our faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Did you hear that? It's a spiritual kind of faith. It's a God kind of faith. It's nothing you can put your hands on or work your way through. You just accept it for what it is. God said it. I believe it. It's mine. Now I want to put it to work to prove the goodness, the faithfulness, the love and the joy and the, and the grace of my God who gave it to me to enjoy. To let others see what he's already revealed to me. It's a spiritual thing. If our faith has been big enough to receive salvation and to overcome every rejection. Now listen. Every lie Satan threw at you. Then our faith is sufficient to raise the dead. Oh, I wasn't talking about health that time. <laughs> I went to the big one. Why? Because that's what God said, that he can raise the dead. Jesus did it. Is Jesus in you? Is the power of the living Christ in us? Hmm. Then we do have the faith of providence and we don't use it. Because it's already been given. It's a gift of God. You already have it. Romans 3, 27, where there is boasting, then it is excluded. But what law of works? No, but the law of faith. Did you know faith was a law? The Bible said it. Ephesians 4, 5 says there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now here in Romans 3.27, it says no boasting, ex all, everything else excluded, but w w by what law of works? No, but by the law. Write that down. Romans 3.27, go look. But by the law of faith, everything operates by the law of faith. And you go, but we're not under the law. Okay. There is a law that we all understand very clearly. First of all, a law is very sufficient in what it was designed to do. Has anybody ever gone on top of a building and hoping or desiring for a safe downward thrust? God, I'm stepping out in faith that you're going to save me from this seven-story fall. But there's a law that is inactive it is in effect and laws don't change you step off of that building you're going down it's called the law of gravity that's why we call it the law everything that's up here and wants to go down all you got to do is let go it's not going up there it's going down and it's the same thing with our faith the, a law is something that is consistent oh i love that did you know faith is consistent? 
Yeah, because it's a law. It's a law of God. You can't please God without it because it's his law. It's the law of faith. Mm. Think about this. If the laws of faith could fall, the universe would self-destruct. I was talking about deceit. I was talking about beware. We know this one, John 10, 10. Satan only comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. What's he after? Well, he's after me. You know, he, 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 he's trying to take me to hell. No, he's not. He's trying to steal the word. See, in you is the word. John 1, 1. It's not the word you read. It's the living word. That from the beginning of time, he is the word. The word that God spoke, it all took place. And everything that was happening, everything that was created, was created by the spoken word. And it was the Holy Spirit that did the work. Think of Jesus, his time on earth. He can't, the Holy Spirit come upon him, and immediately he went out and started doing ministry after he went through his time of suffering and testing. Then he started his ministry. I heard him say over and over, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. I never seen him stop and take three days off. And we all think it was because it was the, the, the evilness or the sickness that was in him. No, it wasn't. It was the doubt and unbelief. Boy, you guys got silent. We, we, we've already been through this. What he was talking about is the doubt and unbelief. It only comes out by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting, what is that? That's taking away from our humanness and giving up the things of the flesh to honor and seek the wisdom of God. To spend time before his presence. Spend time in his word. Time in prayer. Asking God for the knowledge and the understanding, the wisdom, the spiritual wisdom of this fast. What is it for? So out of it, I come out with a, a truer understanding, a, 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 a manifestation of what the word says. See, once they knew that, then they could operate. They could do the works of Christ. That happened at Pentecost. So there's things that have to take place. Amen? In closing, all right, one more. Come on, you got to go with me. Second Peter, I haven't done this in a while, so. Give me some slack. My wife, my wife is going back there. Oh, no. He said he was going to make it short. Second Peter, chapter 1. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine, divine power has given to us all things. What does all mean? Nothing lacking. Ain't no lackers in here. All things that pertain to life, and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. There again, as I said, he called us. By which we have been given to, been given to us exceedingly great. Oh, oh, now listen. Now, how can, this, how can this verse be true and we speak that God doesn't heal everybody? God doesn't provide all of your needs. You know, there's still things you have to do in order to get God to listen to you. Well, then you can take this page and throw it out. By which we've given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may, through what? What are these? It says through these. What are the these? The promises. Precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Oh my goodness. Not just I'm a part of the family. 
I have his divine nature living in me. And so do you, if you're born again. Having divine nature, having escaped, uh uh-oh, that means you've already left. It's not around. It, you've already escaped. You're no longer in prison. You're no longer trapped. You're all not. You're not. You're no longer confined by the things of this world. You may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption. That's the world that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligent, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and so on and so on. Book verse 8. For if these things are yours, ask your question, are they yours? Do I operate And live my life according to these virtues, these divine virtues that are already present. It's already working. All you got to do is flip the switch on. Okay? For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and uh, Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. He's a doubter because you can't see the truth because we're focused on the things that are in front of us that are uh, of nature. They're of this world. They're that, that's what, I, what is affecting me. I feel the pain. It's the pain. And I focus on the pain rather than the healing, which is the, wor- the, the divine nature that already lives in me. His name is Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness. Can I, can I add something in there? And I know you're not supposed to add deafness. Because not only do we become blind, we stop listening to truth, that is. And has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren... Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Amen and amen. 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 Remember, we're world overcomers. We're not here to go through troubled times. Jesus said, I've already taken care of it. Yeah, you're going to have some things come at you. But walk in the joy and the knowledge of knowing Jesus has already overcome it. Overcome it. It's mine. I have a promise against this affliction. I have a promise against this um, lack. If you lack, you lack in your mind. That's your soul, man. Because your spirit, man, can never say that you lack. Because it is the spirit and the mind of God living in you. The truth of God. He cannot say that. Amen. All right. Amen. Amen.